at the beginning of the month on March 2nd, we had a primary in Texas and I had a couple opponents filed against me. And I thought, wow, you know, they're even coming after me. I'm an incumbent, so what, what's this going to be like? So I thought, I got to worry, and I thought, well, if I lose, I'll move to Idaho. <laughs> <laughs> But, but I was able to sneak out a close victory with 81%. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Is this on? All right. I'm Trevor Gregg. I'm the student body president here at Boise State. And thank you. And on behalf of Boise State, I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Ron Paul Congressman Ron Paul to our university this evening. Um, I will be conducting the question and answer session. We beforehand we had all of you fill out questions that you had for Dr. Paul, so we'll take a few minutes now to ask a few of those questions. And I've got them here in my pocket, so hopefully I can read you guys' handwriting. Um, the first question we, we picked it comes from a youngster, a young guy, and it says, "How do you become a politician? What is required?" <laughs> Well, if if you if you people do ask me that a lot, how to and they put it down, boy, how how can I get involved and go to Congress? And my answer generally, if you want to be a politician or get into Congress, is don't set that as your goal. <laughs> <laughs> I think that that should be your secondary goal. The first one is what I mentioned: you have to know the issues and you have to make yourself available, and it might lead to a political career. But too many people want to uh, set the goal of being a congressman. They think it's just organization work. They think that, oh, how do I go through precinct work and I go to state and then the Senate and then to run for Congress and how do you raise the money and all that. I, I, don't, I don't think that that is a good idea. I think that if you know the issues, somebody will make good use of you and uh, you may end up with a, with a political career. But uh, I, I don't think that should, should be the goal. That should be secondary. That leads us into the next question very well. Why stay Republican? Both parties have failed the people. Why have both parties failed? It really wasn't a question. I guess the person was more of a statement. Both parties have failed the people. Yeah, I, I, would, I would agree with that. And I've, I sort of answered that in, in the talk. And that is, uh, it's been too bipartisan because they both endorse the same ideas. That's why I emphasize study, understand the issues, and, and the difference. Uh, Basically, uh, we have been conditioned over many, many years that an interventionist uh, foreign policy, a uh, monetary policy of fiat currency, uh, a welfare state based on a distorted view of rights has been endorsed by both sides because our intellectual community did. The intellectual community is very important, but I think that is what change, is changing, and then uh, uh, maybe the, but, but you know, if there is a, it, not it, if, when the true revolution comes, actually it won't be partisan. You know, let's say we have these views infiltrate, it will affect both parties. Uh, the bad ideas affected both parties. Right now, what we need are the good ideas to affect both parties. Again, a question for the youth here. For younger people that don't know a lot or don't have courage, how can they stand up for others and to the government? Well, I guess everybody stands up in different ways. I, I think you can't stand up unless you have confidence. And uh, some, sometimes, you know, it's difficult, uh, but what, what sustains me, because uh, I think I have a, a bit of a record in Washington for the number of times I voted by myself. <laughs> but uh, to be able to, and that, it, <laughs> but I, I, get my, I get my strength from that by conviction that others have been, you know, by trying to weigh the other, other people's views and coming up and making a decision what I think is right or wrong and the interpretation of the Constitution. So a lot of people point out my shortcomings in my delivery and different things, and, and there are some shortcomings. But one thing I, I am convinced of 
or the views are correct, and that gives me my strength. What are your thoughts about repealing the 17th Amendment? A good idea. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that won't happen until, and, and until we get back to the whole concept that we uh, have a loose-knit group of states together and that we don't have a centralized government. So that, uh, that will come someday if we eventually win back the entire revolution. Do you believe the Iranians are building a nuclear bomb, and if so, what should the U.S. do about it? I, th I think they would like to, and I think they would like the potential to do it. I don't think they're on the verge of doing it. Our CIA said the last time they had evidence that they were working on a nuclear bomb was in 2003. Uh, but they're surrounded by nuclear weapons. Uh, Israel has them, uh, Pakistan has them, India has them, uh, Russia has them, and the United States have ships on their borders and we're loaded with them, so they're totally surrounded. Uh, so, if, uh, if for some reason they got one, I would uh, treat them like I treated the Soviets, you know, with uh, uh, willingness to talk and work with people, because uh, they, they the, the, the Iranians aren't, if they get one or two or three or four, what are they going to do with them? Are they going to launch them toward Israel, United States? I mean. The country would be gone in minutes. They're, they're not likely to do that. All they are looking for is a little bit of respect. I mean, I know. <laughs> so I, I think the war drums are beaten, and they, they want to get the people riled up so that you're ready to put on. Uh, they're ready to put on tough sanctions. Who suffers with the tough sanctions? You know, we've had sanctions on Cuba for 40 years, and I think it's time to get rid of sanctions and trade with Cuba and travel to Cuba. And tough sanctions on, uh, tough sanctions on Iran won't help. It'll just make the p p problems that much worse and punish the ch people over there and not do much to, to harm to the government. How do you respond to the critics who say there's not enough gold to support the current money supply for a 100% gold-backed currency? Well, if, if you understand it, any amount of gold will work. Um, prices just have to adjust. And uh, for two or 3,000 years that they've been measuring gold production, gold, gold generally in, increases about 3% a year, two, time, two to four, 3% a year, which would, be, which would sustain it. But as long as your prices adjust, it, it, it doesn't matter. If you nearly, you're not going to carry the gold around. I mean, you just have to have a measurement. It's sort of like asking, how many yardsticks do you need? You know, it's a measurement of value. You can divine credit. Uh, you know, if you, uh, if if GMC is making a loan for a car, you can make that in in terms, measure it in terms of gold. But you don't literally have to have the gold for every single transaction. So there is enough gold. Hans Sandholz many years ago wrote an article about this very subject, he convinced me that you don't really have to, uh, to worry about that. There will be an increase. Milton Friedman, who didn't believe in the gold standard, he picked a number. He says, what we need is to get rid of the Federal Reserve and, and uh, replace it with a computer and let them print money at 3% a year. So he was, it was sort of a paper gold standard. But of course, uh, if a government is given the, uh, the power to create money at 3% a year, they'll do four, five, six, seven, or whatever they want to do. <laughs> we only have time for one more question. Okay. And the question is, are you running for president in 2012? <laughs> no, no decision has been made on that yet. But thank you. Thank you for your support. Thank you.